Welcome to Akatink Unitarian Universalist Church. I am Christina Watts, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm happy to be your worship associate today. I hope you got a name tag, or have put your name on your Zoom name tag, and if you need help with that, uh, please let us, let us know in the chat. If you aren't new to Akatink, look around. Do you see people who you haven't met or who you haven't spoken to in a while? Help us live up to our mission to be a welcoming and inclusive spiritual home for all by reaching out and making a connection. By visiting our congregation, newcomers are in a transition moment, and people in transitions are more open to new friendships. Whether you're a longtime member or a newcomer or something in between, we encourage you to stay for our social hour online and in person immediately after the service. We're so delighted that you decided to join us today. Welcome. I love that that bell has like take a breath energy and be quiet, come to order energy too. <laughs> I'm always a little reluctant to, to stop you from that greet your neighbor time because I know that's why you're really here is to see each other and spend time together and build community and deepen with each other. Uh, to that point, um, I invite you all to rise in body or in spirit and join as we light our chalice in reciting the words on the screen, which are from our mission statement. So these are the three things that we commit to doing together. Let's say it all together. Together we care in community. Together we grow in spirit. Together we act for justice. I just want to give a sense of what I'm going to be talking about today and, and also what's coming up in the next couple weeks. So we've been exploring the theme of covenant this month, uh, but this is the real like covenant sermon, right? The like, this is what it is sermon. So that's what's happening this morning. Next Sunday, we're launching our social justice study action issue for the year. So every year we have a different social justice study action issue. Last year was transgender justice. This year it's reproductive justice. So Jen Carlson is gonna be preaching on that. Two years ago when I first arrived here, Jen did a knockout sermon before I had my first moment in the pulpit. So I really encourage you to come because we're gonna be looking into that study action issue and because she's just such a wonderful uh, lay preacher. And then as we move into September, our theme changes to welcome. We're looking at covenant in a different way for the whole year because the Unitarian Universalist Association, of which this congregation is a part, voted to try on some new values. It's called the Article 2 of our bylaws, but it has our value statements. So our current seven principles might be replaced by these new values, and we're going to spend a year exploring them. And there's also a purpose section in that document and an um, inclusivity section. So in the month of September, we're going to be exploring welcome and inclusivity. How appropriate is that since the other line of our mission statement that we didn't say all together is that this is a welcoming and inclusive spiritual home. It's like, it's like they made it for us, right? The whole denomination was like, let's give them a gift and make the first month about welcome and inclusion. Thank you. I looked up, but then I was like, no, I have to look side to side. This is a UU congregation. <laughs> uh, so, so, so welcome and inclusion in September, um, but also just some wonderful stuff. So on, on September 10th, so the second Sunday, Voice, which is the Interfaith Justice Coalition that we're a part of, in uh, gratitude for how many people from this congregation showed up for the last action for mental health care, to get more focus on mental health care and more money and services for mental health care in the state of Virginia. We had 29 people show up, which wasn't the largest number of people, but I think it was the highest percentage of membership. So they're going to give us a lunch on September 10th. Did you hear that? They're going to they're gonna bring food. All you have to do is listen to me for a little bit, and, and you get free food on the 10th, okay? So I encourage you to come out for that. Uh, and then the next week, we're going to do our in-gathering and water communion, which normally happens on the Labor Day, the Sunday after Labor Day, which would be the 10th, but we're moving it to the 17th. 
because there's a lot going on that Sunday. We're also going to have our meal gathering, and we're going to have more food. We're going to have a potluck that Sunday. And let me tell you, the board had a retreat yesterday, and we had a potluck, and OMG, like, there was so much good food. There was this soup and two kinds of quiche. The vegetarian one was better than the meat one. I'm just saying. It, was, it just tasted better. And it was better for the environment, but it also just tasted better. I mean, it was just fresh figs from, like, an actual fig tree, a member's fig. I mean, so in the Quran, it says that peoples, and it's talking about, like, different religions, different cultures, should compete in the doing of good works. So I'm saying don't like do a sign up genius and like find out who's bringing the dessert and the salad and you know so that it's all balanced. Compete in doing the best food, right? <laughs> good food competition for the potluck. Just bring your like your signature dish, okay? I just want it to taste good. If it's all salad but it's like the most amazing salad I've ever had, like, I'll be happy, okay? So you, you got that. From the Quran, compete in doing good works to compete in bringing good food to the potluck on September 17th, okay? You got a month to plan out your best dish and get it ready, okay? And then it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. The next Sunday, we're going to have a special guest speaker. This is a surprise for now. And I'm getting installed as your minister, which I know is a little weird because I've been here for two years. But remember, I was a contract minister, and there was the pandemic, and then you called me as your settled minister last October. So, you know, it, it took us a while to get to the organization. But we're going to celebrate not me, but our journey together, right? The journey that we're on together. And it's going to be so much fun, and we're going to have also special guests for that uh, in the afternoon, right? So there's a regular service, and after, I know it's... You guys are like, shut up already. <laughs> Time for all ages. I have to say, that was so beautiful. We got so quiet. I just wanted to be, have you heard that story about the king who used to fall asleep whenever the composer would play a piece? Haydn. Haydn. So Haydn, so he made like a quiet piece and then he was like, ah, right? Like it was like a big bang moment. I, I wanted to do that, but I, I didn't. <laughs> but it was just so, the, the, the like energy was so chill. Um, I, I know, I just, but, I, but I gave you warning. I, I, I did give you warning. Like, I held back, um, which is saying a lot for me. Um, before, before Olivia leads us in this, I, I just want to point out that, am I right that school is starting? This is a hint. We, we have our wonder box up here. Am I right that school is starting? That's true for Fairfax County. Is it also true for Prince William? OK, OK. I, I, and what? And Culpepper as well? So, I just moved to Stafford, which is Stafford County, and school already started there. And I'm sharing that because what that means is that I've been, I had a cold all week, right? So my child started last week and brought the cold home, and that's why I'm wearing a mask so that you all don't get my cold. I mean, it's not that bad, but it's, it's, not, it's been all week. It's not fun. So you, you have something to look forward to, parents, um, <laughs> with school starting. So, so, so we got... Um, the chair of the Children and Youth Spiritual Development Committee. Um, Ashley could not make it today, so I'm here to introduce our Time for All Ages. Do I have anyone that is interested or wondering what's in the wonder box? Anyone? Come on. you got, you got to be wondering. Who, Look at this. It looks like a treasure chest. It's a treasure chest. It might be full of treasure. You, you can come. You can both come. Anyone else? Can come Anyone else up. want to help? Yeah. What's in the box? All right, let, let's, let's open it up. Let's see what's in there. Let's I see. promise it won't jump out at you. Oh, 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 it's a backpack. Ooh. OK, awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful backpack. That is. is it's that? got something on a, here. It says, together we care in community. Together we grow in spirit. Together we act for justice. That, that sounds a little familiar. Can I have that one? And, and, and you, you want this one? No, I just want the, the oh, bookmark. Oh, the bookmark. <laughs> Well, this is the only one I see. It also says, oh. you are loved. You can do this. Akatink, you use, got your back. Oh, oh it changed my mind. I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, but it's a backpack. Sh I mean, this is another kind of wonder box. Like, I mean, there might be something in here. Do you think we should open it up? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's see. Let's see if there's anything else in there. Oh, look! There's more! Look at that! Do you think, and, and we probably need more helpers for this. We want to hand these helpers? out to whoever wants one. So raise your hand if you want one of these. It's a bookmark, but it also doubles as something you can put on a bag, okay? Come on up. Come we on need up. more helpers. Come on. You want to help? Come help and, and hand them out to folks, okay? Our reading today is Spilling the Light by the Reverend Julian Jamaica Soto. Some people are used to keeping rules, like don't cross the street when the light is red. Only sensible. It turns out that keeping rules isn't the same as keeping covenant, which asks us, instead of keeping a bright line, to keep our promises. To what have we promised ourselves? To this moment in time and place. To this community, and even, tenderly interconnected, this planet. We promise ourselves to the idea that we are each and all human beings. We promise that there is something moving between us that cannot tame and cannot measure. The chalice is a reminder that what flames we keep inside us cannot light the way. The light must spill to shine. The thing you must be is yourself, unadulterated, shredding the willingness to journey alone as though you are made of something hard and unforgivable. You are human. You belong right here, right now. And together, we chase away the sickness, the secrets, and leave only the open possibility that the future is a space for growth. Finally, we got to the good part. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to talk about covenants. You heard the word covenant in that reading, and I mentioned that it's actually a covenant that we're going to be studying all year. And so covenants are ubiquitous in Unitarian Universalism because we're not a creedal faith, which is just a kind of fancy way of saying that you can have multiple viewpoints, especially theologically, about whether there's a God or not, or multiple gods, or I'm just not sure. I thought there was yesterday, but I'm not so sure anymore today. Like, you can have all those views. What brings us together is covenant. And while we make a lot of covenants in UU congregations, sometimes the, the children's program will have a covenant. Committees might have covenants that they make together about how to be together. Today, I'm not going to talk about specific covenants so much as the practice of covenant. So below the like, particular words and commitments we, wait, we make, there's a deeper commitment to stay in relationship with each other through the good times, through the tough times, and to do it in a way that is grounded in respect and compassion, trust, and support. So I'm going to take a, a, a side road for a moment and share a little bit about couples therapy. Um, I, my wife is here online, uh, who is a UU minister as well and was serving another congregation, but is going to be a, a chaplain resident uh, coming up in a week. Uh, so I hope after she hears this uh, sharing about couples therapy uh, that she'll come back to church. Um, so most couples therapy, I don't know if you know this, but most couples therapy teaches conflict resolution and active listening techniques. Do you think that's effective? It, it isn't, okay? It has a one-third short-term success rate. Why? Because it's superficial, because it doesn't get to the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue is trust. The heart of the issue is support. It's knowing the other person will be there through thick and thin. Psychologist Sue Johnson has developed emotionally focused couples therapy, focusing on this deeper need for secure attachment that comes from nurturing trust. 
Psychologist John Gottman, who developed the Gottman Method, writes that conflict in a relationship is not an indicator of whether couples stay together. Or rather, what makes the difference is the details of how the couple engages in conflict. And, and this is a little different than we might expect. So Gottman has defined five conflict styles among couples. Conflict avoidant, volatile, validating, hostile, and hostile detached. You might be surprised to learn that three out of five of these conflict styles are healthy. Conflict avoidance can work, and usually does. Volatile couples can thrive, and usually do. Validating couples thrive too, but not any better than conflict avoidant or volatile couples. Gottman has found that it isn't ultimately about whether or not the couple is comfortable with engaging in conflict or avoids engaging in conflict. What makes the difference is whether during conflict the couples express a lot of contempt for each other, whether they're highly critical of each other, whether they get defensive, whether they stonewall each other. These are the behaviors that happen in hostile couples and hostile detached couples. And in case you're wondering, usually hostile detached couples end up getting divorced. While hostile couples, though miserably unhappy together, <laughs> stay married. <laughs> That's what the research shows, I'm just saying. Now I'm gonna share with you that early in my relationship with my now spouse, during the first five years, we went to a lot of couples therapy over those five years. I think we saw three different couples therapists at different moments. And looking back, the focus of that couples therapy was on conflict resolution and active listening skills. So I have to say, when even later in our relationship, when I read in a book by John Gottman about the terrible track record most couples therapy has, I was frankly overjoyed. <laughs> I read that and I thought, it's not us. <laughs> this shit doesn't work. <laughs> couples therapy doesn't work for anybody. <laughs> that is the, the superficial kind of couples therapy with its dismal 33 and a third percent short-term success rate. Short-term, that means the success that you might have if you're lucky in that one-third group is going to fade over time. In contrast, the, there are two kinds of couples therapy that get to the core of the issue. The Gottman method and emotionally focused couples therapy both have a 75 to 85 percent long-term success rate. My wife and I did about 10 years ago after I read in that Gottman book, Get Some Emotionally Focused Couples Therapy, and hallelujah, it was amazing. We do, it, I realized when I was thinking about that, it's been 10 years, like we're coming up on 150,000 miles. The warranty is, is gone, you know, so we might want to go in for a tune-up. I'm sharing about my own marriage and the fact that we've had struggles along the way to destigmatize reaching out for professional therapeutic support from a psychologist, whether it's for your marriage or for other reasons. And to do it, to find someone who's trained in a therapeutic model with a proven track record, in this case, in helping to rebuild bonds and nurture trust. But this sermon isn't actually about romantic partnerships, not at all. I'm sharing about couples therapy, the kind that works and the kind that doesn't, to make a point about covenant to make the point that covenant is not etiquette. Etiquette is a standardized code of behavior that's polite, that's nice, that's societally agreed on to be polite and nice. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Conflict resolution and active listening are not bad things. It's just not covenant, or the deepest kind of covenant at least. Now sometimes, 
when we make covenants in UU context, within committees and small groups especially, we do focus on behaviors. And sometimes we set out polite and respectful behaviors that help members resolve conflict and practice democracy among themselves, including things like be on time, give everyone a chance to speak. These are not bad practices, but I think they're somewhat like couples therapy that's focused on conflict resolution and active listening skills. They help keep the peace, at least in the short term, at least on the surface, but they aren't really, truly, and deeply covenantal. The practice of covenant is a harder and a more rewarding thing. Recently, a UUA commission studied covenant, releasing a report in June of 2021. And the report cautions that while reigning in chaos at meetings by means of politeness can seem like a fundamentally good idea, there is a hidden and often unconscious cultural bias inherent in how a society thinks of politeness. What white culture deems to be impolite is not necessarily what other cultures hold to be impolite. The report continues emphasizing that the dominant culture can use the mask of politeness to dismiss, dismiss what it wants to suppress, again, often unconsciously, and in the process push a dominant cultural norm onto marginalized communities, forcing them to assimilate to the dominant cultural norm, leaving their cultural, forcing them to leave their cultural inheritance and its gifts to the community at the door, outside the door. It's not very welcoming and inclusive, is it? In contrast, the report states, if covenants are to be truly mutual and sacramental, yes, the UUA report did use the word sacramental, our covenants must be created with respect for the various ways that cultures view and judge diverse styles of interpersonal communication. Remember from the example of romantic couples, validating couples, volatile couples, and conflict avoiding couples all have thriving, happy, long-lasting partnerships. You could say that their etiquettes differ dramatically, right? It's impolite in one to yell, and it's perfectly okay in another to yell, right? Their etiquettes differ. But their practice of covenant in those different etiquette styles share the same core values of mutuality, respect, compassion, support, the support that builds bonds when conflict arises and that nurtures an underlying foundation of trust. This is what we want our practice of covenant to do, that deeper work, that truer work not to enforce a particular style of interpersonal communication that is the interpersonal communication style of the dominant cultural group in the society or in the congregation, but to practice true covenant grounded in that mutuality, respect, compassion, and support that builds bridges between differences, that even celebrates diversity, a practice of covenant that works through conflict in a way that in the end, because of how we stay deeply committed to honoring each other, in the end brings us closer together, even through the rough moments, nurturing a foundation of trust that gets us through those tough times that we are inevitably, as human beings, going to face together. So years ago, I watched the movie The Band's Visit. It's an Israeli movement, the movie that came out in 2007. It's now also a Broadway musical. In this movie, an Egyptian police band, a marching band, ends up in the wrong place while on a diplomatic tour in Israel. So you watch this Egyptian marching ba band who instead of arriving in Petah Tikva, a middle-sized city in Israel, ends up in the fictional Beit HaTikva, a lonely, desolate, small town in the middle of nowhere. 
and attempts to navigate an alien culture. Now, Egyptian and Israeli culture couldn't be more different in their interpersonal communication styles, at least as depicted in the movie. In an early humorous scene, you see the leader of the marching band trying to clear up the confusion on the phone with an Israeli. The meticulously polite and formal Egyptian begins the phone call with a litany of honorifics and is repeatedly hung up on by the impatient Israeli official on the other end of the line. So stranded in this nowhere town, the Egyptian marching band is left at the mercy of a small group of locals in that desolate town at the end of the world. And the cultural misses continue. The brash Israeli culture, which some might even call rude, clashing with the neurotically precise and repressed Egyptian police band. But something wonderful also happens. In twos and threes, the Egyptian police band is offered hospitality by the small town Israelis. Each of the locals on hand offers to house a few of the band members. And though the cultural differences continue to confound, the loss in translationness of the whole thing resolves into intimate, vulnerable, moments of connection. Characters share deep tragedies that have happened in their lives with each other, and also how to get a girl <laughs> in a very humorous scene. I mean, you should see the movie just for that scene. Now remember, conflict-avoiding couples, like perhaps like the Egyptian, Egyptian police bands, tend to be happy and thriving. And volatile couples, like those Israelis, you know Israelis call themselves sabras, which means cactuses. Like they, they chose that as a nickname for themselves. Volatile couples, like Israeli culture, tends to be happy and thriving as well. And in this movie, the two disparate interpersonal styles are able to connect across cultural differences and nurture trust and support that gets them through challenging times, both hilarious and poignant. This is the point of my sermon. Covenant isn't etiquette. I also want to share that I was a preschool teacher in Jewish preschools for nearly eight years, including five years while I was putting myself through seminary. Now, one of those preschools the one that I went to when I was putting myself through seminary in Berkeley, California, was a Hebrew-rich educational environment, which meant that about half of the, my fellow teachers were Israelis. And I also happened to grow up in a familiar culture where interrupting each other is normative and not frowned upon. I'm not just preaching this sermon so that y'all will let me interrupt you. Okay, maybe a little bit. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I have a Jewish friend, though, who once shared, she said, when I'm not being interrupted in a conversation, I feel like the other person isn't really listening to me. Get that? I mean, we always hear, like, don't think of, of what you're going to say before the other, while the other person is speaking. Not if you're Jewish. That means you're not paying attention. You're not listening. It means you're, the other person, she continued, isn't really excited about what she's saying. They're not fully engaged. Personally, I resonate with that. I love it when someone interrupts me with an interjection, an interjection that riffs off something that I was saying, that adds new layers or nuance or even disagrees and argues with what I was saying. And as a skilled and practiced interrupter myself, I'm able to jump right back into what I was saying before I was interrupted. As soon as they're done, I'm like, OK, yeah, sure. And I'm right back on track. And, and I also, if I'm interrupting, I can bring the other person back. I, I can interrupt and then say, and you were saying, da 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 da, and they can just pick up the ball and keep going. My spouse, however, can't do this. I mean, she really can't do it. Whenever I interrupt her, not only does it frustrate her deeply, she has a very difficult time even remembering what she was saying before the interruption. 
her flow is completely disrupted. So what do we do? Etiquette would, etiquette would solve this problem by imposing some behavioral rules onto the interaction. Either I would have to stop interrupting her, or she would have to learn to accommodate my interpersonal style and become an interjecting, jazz riffing interrupter. Notice how I made that sound really good. Um, <laughs> etiquette might give us a solution, but it would be one that took something away from one of us. Do you see that? How etiquette would have one style named correct and then make it dominant over the other style, would make one person in a dominant position over the other. That's not covenant. That's not a foundation for nurturing trust. That's not a connection based in mutual respect and the celebration of differences. Like the small town Israelis and the Egyptian police band were called to a more difficult, but ultimately more rewarding journey together. That journey together, that's the practice of covenant. And that's where I stopped writing my sermon because I was like, they probably want a solution. Like, they want to know how we got past the interrupting thing. Right? <laughs> but I don't have one. <laughs> I don't have one for you. Except to say this. We didn't come up with an etiquette solution. Right? We didn't impose some kind of rules on the situation. We stayed in the game with each other. And what we didn't do is bring in contempt, criticism, defensiveness, or stone. Okay, everybody does it sometimes, y'all. But sometimes when we're at our best, right, we avoid those things. Because that's what hurts a relationship. That's what's out of covenant. Is not whether the interruption happens or doesn't happen, but if the person says, by interrupting me, you are a bad person, right? I have the right way of doing things, or vice versa, Oh, you can't keep your train of thought? You must not have something very important to say, huh? Right? That's how you tank a relationship. The practice of covenant is about remaining in respectful, mutual dialogue to figure out in each moment, right? Like our reading said, in each moment, different, figuring it out together finding the way together that works for you in that moment together. So I'm going to close. I mentioned the reading. I'm going to close by sharing that reading with you again. Some people are used to keeping rules. Don't cross the street when the light is red. Only sensible. It turns out that keeping rules isn't the same as keeping covenant. Side note, covenant is not etiquette. It turns out that keeping rules isn't the same as keeping covenant, which asks us, asks us, instead of keeping a bright line, to keep our promises. To what have we promised ourselves? To this moment in time and place, to this community, and even tenderly interconnected, this planet. We promise ourselves to the idea that we are each and all human beings. We promise that there is something moving between us that we cannot tame and cannot measure. There is something moving between us that we cannot tame and cannot measure. The chalice is a reminder that what flame we keep inside us cannot light the way. The light must spill to shine. The thing you must be is yourself, unadulterated, shedding the willingness to journey alone. Shedding the willingness to journey alone as though you are made of something hard and unforgivable. You are human. You belong right here, right now, and together. Together we will chase away the sickness, the secrets, and leave only the open possibility that the future is a space for growth. That's covenant. Leaving only the open possibility that the future is a space for growth.
May it be so. May we be among those who make it so. Amen, 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 and blessed be. You may now rise in body or spirit, and you may extend your hands or join them if you're comfortable. As we extinguish our chalice, I invite you to join me now in our community blessing with these words of David Bumbau. This church is dedicated to the proposition that behind all our differences and beneath all our diversity, there is a unity that makes us one and binds us forever together in spite of time and death and the space between the stars. We pause now in silent witness to that unity. Now that we've gathered together in this welcoming and inclusive spiritual home, let us go out into the world nourished, rejuvenated, and inspired to share our values, to live our values. Happy Sunday. Enjoy the fellowship of our social hour.